Hello and welcome back to The Pisky Trap, a series where we explore the folklore, history and legends from across Devon and Cornwall. Thank you again to everyone who's been listening so far for all your tweets, your messages and feedback on our last episode exploring the idea of Cornish ghost layers. If you enjoyed that episode, and if you've been enjoying this series so far, then please give us a like and a follow. You can find The Pisky Trap on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And if you'd like to help me keep this project going, allowing me to research, to collaborate with folklorists, historians, storytellers, creatives and other specialists trying to understand and to keep alive the folklore, history and storytelling traditions of the South West, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the Pisky Trap. Before we get cracking with the episode, I just wanted to mention the work of a brilliant company that I discovered recently called Med Theatre, who draw inspiration from Dartmoor to create their work, from projects drawing upon the landscape, the local history, heritage and folklore, to the realities of rural life, both in the past and in the present. They take a lot of their work to rural communities and run a range of programmes and performances involving and bringing together young people, as well as adults, to create a range of work and performances. They also have a brilliant site called Dartmoor Resource, which not only details their work, but also has an archive of local folklore, myth and history. So I highly recommend checking out dartmoorresource.org.uk and medtheatre.co.uk. All right then, on with the episode. I wanted to return to a theme that's cropped up in a couple of episodes in the past, particularly when we explored Jamaica Inn and Chambercombe Manor, and that is smuggling. A lot of places around the UK have a history linked with smuggling, but I think Devon and Cornwall in particular often capture people's imagination when you mention the subject. And I suspect it's largely down to the work of writers like Daphne du Maurier, who wrote these fantastic and romanticised stories that incorporated smuggling and wrecking. But there's also this range of folklore and legends. There are so many stories out there that chronicle the daring feats of smugglers sailing across the channel and bringing back these huge hordes of contraband, of secret tunnels between churches, pubs and houses for stashing the goods, of whole communities being involved, even local magistrates, of fights between bands of smugglers and the revenue men, tales of murders and betrayals, And all of this, of course, has led to hundreds of local legends and ghost stories over the years. But what was the reality? What was smuggling a couple of hundred years ago really like? And how did it all work? So much is shrouded in folklore, romanticism and lots of embellishments over the years that it can be hard to try and separate the myth from the reality. That said... There's one particular individual who was incredibly successful and earned a real reputation in the smuggling business, who kept a record in a series of ledgers which offer us a real glimpse into how smuggling could be run on a large scale. Now, smuggling is such a broad topic that it would be impossible to do it justice in one episode. I've chosen here to focus on one particular town in the southeast of Cornwall, and the impact of this one particular individual on that community and the smuggling enterprise there. So this is going to be an exploration of the town of Polpero and the work of a man named Zephaniah Job, who became so successful he was known as the smuggler's banker. Helping me along the way will be Jeremy Rowett Johns, an author and local historian, and founder of the Polpero Heritage Press, who's written a number of books on Cornish smuggling, including a book on Zephaniah Job. We're going to be looking at Job himself as an individual, 
what we can learn about him through his ledgers, how he became involved at Polpero, and how the smuggling operation worked, as well as the conflict between the smugglers and the revenue men sent to stop them. We'll also be exploring how folklore has impacted on our view of smuggling compared with the reality back in the 18th and early part of the 19th centuries. And I should perhaps say at the outset that there will be the odd descriptions of violence. So, here's our next episode, Zephaniah Job and the Smugglers of Polpero. If you wake at midnight and hear a horse's feet, don't go drawing back the blind or looking in the street. Them that ask no questions isn't told a lie. Watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. Five and twenty ponies trotting through the dark. Brandy for the parson, backy for the clerk. Laces for a lady, letters for a spy. Watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. The opening couple of verses there from the famous poem A Smuggler's Song by Rudyard Kipling, and I think they're a perfect example of the images that are often conjured up the moment that you mention smuggling. That sense of a secret enterprise, but one from which everyone benefits, that everyone is in some way, in on it. And yet it also hints at that sense of danger. You know, um, look the other way and keep your mouth shut. Don't breathe a word to the authorities. But as always, what I want to do is delve that bit deeper and get behind the legends and the rumours as much as we can and to try and understand what life was like for those involved in smuggling and how that operated in these little coastal villages and communities. I want to focus on smuggling in Cornwall during the 18th century, because that seems to have been when it was at its height. I also mentioned that I want to pay particular attention to the town of Polpero, which has a long history tied to smuggling. So, why was smuggling so prevalent in the 1700s in particular? Well... According to the Polpero History website, when Britain was at war with its neighbours in the 18th century, duty on many goods was increased considerably, encouraging the Polpero fishermen to smuggle goods such as tea, gin, brandy and tobacco across from Guernsey. So basically, recurring wars with France throughout the 18th century in particular meant higher duties and higher prices and Cornwall, having these links with Guernsey and Brittany, is perfectly situated for this illicit trade of bringing goods across the Channel. So, why Polpero? Why did the people there become involved with the smuggling trade? And what was it like there during the 18th century? There's a great description of the town in one of Jeremy Rowett John's books, which gives us a real sense of what it may have been like. And I quote, The cottages of the few hundred inhabitants crowded round the harbour in a haphazard arrangement. Some perched on rocky ledges, others back to back and side to side as if competing for space along the narrow, tortuous lanes that wound among them. Low roofs of slate and thatch rose up on either side, whilst through the middle past the green ran the fast-flowing torrent that divided the parishes of Talland to the east from that of Lansalos in the west. Many of the houses belonging to the fishermen were constructed of ships' timbers 
and granite stone to withstand the storms that regularly swept up the channel, and their occupants lived on the floor above the ground-level cellars used for storing fish and other provisions for the winter months. End quote. I think you can imagine that if you were walking through Polperro back then, with all of these storage cellars, the smell, that constant smell of fish being everywhere. There's this brilliant little story of when John Wesley, the Methodist preacher, visited Polperro in the 1760s, and he writes in his journal, and I quote, the room over which we were to lodge being filled with pilchards and conger eels, the perfume was too potent for me, so that I was not sorry when one of our friends invited me to lodge at her house. End quote. So we've got some brilliant and vivid descriptions there of Paul Perro, and it's those fish that are so important in communities like this, because for many that's their trade, that's their main source of income but it can be pretty precarious. So it's basically through necessity that many seafarers are being drawn into smuggling. I've got a quote here from the book Smuggling in Cornwall, which reads, Generations of Polperro mariners had supplemented their living by bringing contraband ashore, often at secluded coves along the coast near Polperro, under cover of darkness. In nearby Lantivet Bay, Boats would land stealthily in Palace Cove or Parsons Cove, and the goods carried up the narrow, sunken lane that still leads today to Lansalos Church. Others came into Talland Bay, where, once landed on the beach, the illicit cargoes would quickly disappear into the churchyard above or be taken away inland along the well-trodden paths to secret hiding places where they could be stored safely before being distributed, end quote. We've established that smuggling had obviously been going on in the Polperro area for some time. But what is it about this man, Zephaniah Job, who arrives in the town in around 1770, that has such an impact? And what do we know about him? It seems that he was born in St Agnes, sometime around 1750, the youngest child of Zephanias and Sarah Job. St Agnes at this time is heavily involved in mining for tin, copper and silver, and like many other children, Zephaniah seems to have been involved with the mines from a relatively early age. We've come across the Quilla Cooch family before, but Jonathan Cooch, who seems to have been doctor and confidant to Job in his later life, writes in his History of Paul Perrow, published in 1871, and I quote, Job received an education that was to fit him for the position of mine captain, which requires, besides common arithmetic, a knowledge of mensuration and the lower branches of mathematics, end quote. I think we can take from this that even early on, Zephaniah comes across as pretty smart. He obviously has a good head for figures and geometry, as well as a practical and technical knowledge that's setting him on this path to becoming a mine captain. But we know that something happened, because he never ends up pursuing that path. And then there's the question of why he left St Agnes and ended up in Polperro. There's been some speculation as to exactly what happened, but essentially Zephaniah seems to have been involved in an incident sometime around 1770, and here again we come back to Jonathan Cooch, who says, Job had the misfortune, in a fit of rage, to beat a boy in such a manner that it was supposed his life was in danger. So, some kind of assault on this young man. And over the years there were rumours flying around that he'd actually killed him. It's all a little uncertain. But whatever the circumstances... Zephaniah decides that he has no option but to basically flee St Agnes. Somehow he finds himself in the southeast of the county, and it begs the question how and why did he end up all the way down in Polpero? But we know that he arrives for the first time in 1770, 
and that completely changes things for him. Some weeks back, I had a chat with Jeremy Rowett Johns, whose work I mentioned earlier, and who has a book entitled The Smuggler's Banker, the story of Zephaniah Job of Polpero. And we got talking about the smuggling in Polpero before Zephaniah arrived, as well as his arrival in the town. Do we know how much Polpero was kind of involved in smuggling before Zephaniah Job arrived? I mean, it was clearly going on. Uh, and I think at first he was, th- th- there's some evidence to suggest that he was a bit reluctant to get involved. He arrived in Polpero having to flee from his, his um, home in St Agnes in West Cornwall. Nobody's quite sure what went on there. There was stories that he, you know, that he got into a fight and either killed or severely injured somebody else. But anyway, he, he, um, he arrives in Polpero at young, educated, um, and able to really make a contribution, starting off as a schoolmaster, because that was the only way he could earn a living at the time, very quickly discovering that actually it was, it was the fathers of the sons that he taught who really wanted his help and, ed- you know, benefits of his education by writing letters and handling their affairs. And there were, as that um, wonderful little school book that... Um, yeah. We, we unearthed in Truro many years ago, tells the story of how he slowly and gradually progressed from education, you know, from teaching to smuggling. And it says something about how smart he was, because some of the uh, problems and tasks that he's setting the students sort of boggle my mind, because I think, I, I mean, I always struggle with maths anyway, but when yeah. I looked at it, I kind of went, they are absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, there's like, you know, how many barley corns stretch from Polpero to Lou or something, or I don't know. I mean, unbelievable. And the, and these that was a seven-year-old boy yeah. that was being required to make those calculations. So it was extraordinary. Yeah, fascinating, wasn't it? And yet, and yet, most of the sums were involved quantities of brandy, gin, or rum. <laughs> It always feels like it's kind of preparing them to go on into yes, this. Absolutely. They were being educated for the trade that was to last them. Yeah. It's interesting that Job initially starts out as a schoolmaster, utilising the skills that he clearly has, especially his talent for mathematics and figures. And as we spoke of there, the tasks and problems that he set for his young pupils do boggle the mind a bit. One of them, for example, is calculating the number of wagons that would stretch from Foy to Loo, allowing six yards for the standing of each wagon. As we sort of spoke about there, what's really interesting is that the exercises and the problems that he's setting these students are incorporating things like anchors of rum, tobacco, a hundredweight of tea, things like that. All goods that are being smuggled into Polpero. It seems to have been Job's education and understanding of mathematics and bookkeeping that appealed to those running the Polpero smuggling operation and led to him being recommended to the merchants in Guernsey. I mean, he was absolutely pivotal to the, you know, the contraband trade and the success of it in Polpero because I think elsewhere in Cornwall it was largely pretty uh, disorganised. It was sort of ad hoc. Uh, And there were one or two kind of entrepreneurial agents, usually pub landlords. But it wasn't... uh, I don't think it was ever sort of as as organised as it was in Polpero. And because of the presence of Zephaniah Job, and he was there for, you know, effectively for sort of 60 years... um, well, more than 60 years, actually, but, you know, certainly for 40 or 50 years, he, uh, he, he was actually masterminding the trade. And one of the reasons it, it worked well with him was because he was, first of all, he was educated, he was literate, he could write letters and, and handle, and, and he was able to um, make sure that the Guernsey merchants got paid because that was always the big risk, you see. They were happy to trade with Cornish fishermen, 
all too often, it, you know, they would vanish back to Cornwall with the goods and never get paid. And, and so there was this constant battle to chase up people who owed money. So why Guernsey in particular? It seems that because the Channel Islands were exempt from the taxes imposed by the British government, Guernsey and St Peter Port in particular becomes a real centre for the smuggling trade. You've got merchants there who are importing goods from all over, so things like gin, rum and tea, and then selling it on to the smugglers. These merchants obviously wanted someone that they could trust, so they'd know they would actually get paid, and they chose to put their trust in Zephaniah. We've talked a little bit about this idea that smuggling had become a vital part of the local economy, but it could also prove pretty dangerous. But it's, it sounds like it was quite risky as well sometimes, because not just from uh, revenue officers and things like that, but also, um, is it one of the quillers who, or actually a couple of the quillers was it, that died at sea, but just with the crossing? I think practically all, well, the father, there was, a, there was William, sorry, John Quiller and his three sons, John, William and Richard, all of whom were lost at sea. So, you know, it was risky, but I mean, you have to bear in mind that they were also involved in, in another um, quite lucrative activity, which was privateering. Um, and I think some of them were lost at sea, do it, you know, while they were engaged in that. But nevertheless, it, of course, it was risky. I mean, you you can imagine trying to, to take a small fishing boat or even a big one right across the channel in all sorts of weather, pretty crude navigational aids, and they were running the gauntlet of the revenue vessels that were patrolling the channel in the 1790s, because eventually the the Admiralty woke up to the fact that you know they had to put a stop to this somehow. <laughs> they, were, they were losing money <laughs> themselves. Um, yes, you know, so it was, of course it was risky, absolutely, you know, and, and a, a lot of lives were lost. So clearly, smuggling was a dangerous enterprise for a number of reasons. But some families were certainly impacted when relatives were lost at sea, including the family that we were just chatting about there, the Quillers, you might remember from the previous episodes on piskies and ghost layers the work of Thomas Quiller Cooch. Well, his grandfather, Richard Quiller, was lost at sea in 1796. In fact, Thomas recalled him leaving the key to his quadrant, hanging on the beam of the cottage, and asking that no one touched it till he returned. When he never came back, the tragic key, as it became known, was left hanging there for years afterwards. Richard's own father, Thomas's great-grandfather, was also lost at sea in 1804. Something we started to touch upon was the idea that smuggling was also closely tied to privateering. A privateer is basically a person or the owner of a vessel who is commissioned by the Admiralty to attack and seize enemy ships. So, say you're the owner of a ship, you'd be issued with what's called a letter of mark. So you're then licensed to fit out your vessel and go and attack enemy ships to loot them and take them as a prize. There are risks involved, of course, but there's also the potential to earn quite a bit. It seems that when conflict breaks out with France again in the late 1770s, there are lots of ship owners, realising that it can be quite lucrative, wanting to apply for a letter of mark. And that's when someone like Job, who's able to handle the admin side of things, becomes really useful. I mean, the two activities really went hand in hand because if, if you were enterprising enough to, you know, to be uh, engaged in the contraband trade, then when a, as soon as war broke out with France and Spain, I mean, it didn't take too much to, you know, to decide to sort of equip and fit out a vessel for, you know, to go and attack French and Spanish ships. It, 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 but again, it, it, had to, it had to be very well organised because it required, you know, a lot of uh, huge expenditure to fit out a boat. So what Zephaniah Job did was he, he formed syndicates. Local people would put the money up to finance the whole enterprise. 
And so when, you know, when smuggling wasn't really an option, why not go out and aim for a, a much richer prize at the end of the day? And my, my God, one or two families in Paul Perro became uh, unbelievably rich. The Quillers, particularly, also my, part of my family. A good example of a successful privateering vessel would be the Swallow, of which Job became a joint owner and the ship was involved in both smuggling and privateering. But what's easy to forget is that there's risks and potential competition involved when it comes to capturing enemy vessels as a prize. In 1781, the Swallow is coming back from Portugal with a cargo of tea and wine, among other goods, when she encounters a French ship called La Rousseille and forces them to surrender. This, this is how it goes. The swallow captures the Russe in the Bay of Biscay and is, you know, elated, bringing home a fat prize, only to be then um, encountered by a, um, a, a much bigger privateer called the Harlequin, which mm -hmm. muscles up and says, you know, hey, out the way, I'm having that prize. The commander of the Harlequin not only steals the Russe as a prize, but also all the papers from the Swallow, including her commission as a privateer, claiming the papers are invalid because she's a smuggling vessel. The Harlequin's captain, a man named Feyre or Feyre, then steals the Russe, allows the captain of the Swallow back to his ship, but with a crew of the Harlequin's men, and then sails off to Cork in Ireland, where he leaves the Russe, before escorting the Swallow back to Liverpool. Back in Polpero, as soon as Job finds out what's happened, he heads off to Cork and seems to have been engaged in lengthy legal proceedings. But eventually he manages to take legal possession of the Rousse and then sails back to the Port of London to sell on the goods. But it takes another eight years of battling for Job to eventually see the £500 that he's owed from the sale of the Russe. And I think that says something about his doggedness and persistence and determination. That wrangled on, it went through the courts. Uh, there was all sorts of legal arguments going on. And I think eventually, after about four or five years, Joe got 500 quid back. I mean, he probably must have earned that himself, yeah. I think. But these prizes were valuable. You know, you, you know, you could capture an enemy vessel, um, and uh, you, you know, you had a good share of the cargo. I mean, even though the proceeds were divided up among the crew of the privateer that captured the vessel, plus the um, the so-called you know syndicate members, everybody had a share in the enterprise. So, you know, the proceeds were all divided up very fairly, and it was all laid down. Um, you know, the, they were not insubstantial, like the Quillers who captured that Spanish galleon with 8,000 pounds in 8,000 in those days. I mean, add another three or four noughts. All this aside, the Swallow is still really successful as a privateer. Only a year after the Rousset incident, in September of 1782, she captures a schooner called Le Chardon off of Land's End. Later, in December of that same year, she takes a French coaster called Le Sage Alexis, and four days after that, a Spanish merchant ship, the El San Luis de Bilbao. So Job and the others involved in this venture must have done pretty well. We know, for example, that the El San Luis de Bilbao and her cargo sold for £482 and the cargo of the Sage Alexis, £554. Huge sums of money at that time. Coming back to smuggling now. I'm intrigued to know what happened to this contraband and these smuggled goods once they came into Polpero. There's so many tales and stories from all over Cornwall about the idea of smugglers' tunnels, hidden passages and trapdoors in the local pubs and cottages. 
and I wondered if there was any truth in that. I was wondering, do you have any idea, or do we have any idea how the operation worked once the goods came into Paul Perro? Were they being stored in warehouses, or is there is there there's a lot of mythology or, or folklore at least around this idea of contraband being stored in you know in tunnels or in pubs? Well, it was because I think immediately it was brought ashore. It had to be put somewhere, hmm. and and not always. You see, one of the reasons it probably at one stage that they weren't particularly um, fussy about whether they brought it into Pulpero Harbour, you know, um, even though there was a revenue officer allegedly there, stationed there, um, the stuff was probably brought straight into the harbour and stored in a sort of what they call a cellar, but which might have been probably a fish, you know, a fish curing cellar, I should think, or anything like that. But um, other, you know, other uh, contraband, other contraband was probably brought ashore at, at, in nearby coves like Talland or Lansalos. And um, of course, uh, the, the local inns, you know, w- would be interested in, in um, accepting some of it because, I mean, that would, you know, would be their sort of stock in trade, so to speak. Some of it was then sold on. I don't think it went much further up country. Did they ever have to, um, as far as we know, I know that in some places they would sink um, contraband and then return for it later. I'm guessing that's when it's quite um, hot, for want of a better word, in terms yes. of potential for being caught. I, I think that came later. And my my sort of, uh, my guess is that that, that I mean, you've got to remember that pulp, um, probably during the whole of the second half of the 18th century, smuggling was carried on quite openly in Polpera. That was what sort of enraged the authorities and made them so determined to stop it. But once there was the, you know, the story of the lottery, the 18, it was just after 1800, again, at the t- right at the turn of that century. Um, and thereafter, smuggling was driven underground. A, a revenue boat was positioned in Polpero, revenue vessels were much more vigilant and active and it was much more difficult to carry on as they had bringing the goods across the channel and of course when they did you know rather than risk landing it under the noses of the revenue vessels or the revenue men i should say um some of some of it was quite often sunk offshore yeah exactly as you described We've heard a bit about Job himself, and I've mentioned this family, the Quillers, but I wondered who else was involved with the smuggling operation around that time. Obviously, there's the Quillers and there's Job, but is there anyone else who is also kind of like very much pivotal to the, that, the operation in, in Polpero? Well, I, we know? I, I tend to group them. But there, there were the, you know, the smugglers who were the fishermen, you probably ought to include um, certainly my family, and I've got two branches of my family. There are the Rowitz and the Johnses. I mean, um, and and those two families were heavily engaged. Uh, the Rowitz mainly from privateering, but they were certainly smuggling as well. Johns the same, Quillers, and then there's a host of other. N- names that you know you could you could um, list there as well, but they, that that falls into the group of the smugglers. Job then was left to deal with the you know the London agents, and and also I mean because his other key role was getting letters of mark, legal paperwork for privateering. It was quite a complicated business, so an awful lot of form filling and you know applications to to be made before you could even put a boat to sea. And um, well, the, the other thing I was going to mention was the, some of the landlords. You see, that the, the, the most famous one is of Charlie Jolliffe at the Three Pilchards. He was certainly uh, engaged in smuggling because there were all these stories of, you know, Charlie, Charlie Jolliffe would be... Um, seen saddling his horse at midnight, and then you would know what he was about. The Three Pilchards is still there in Paul Perro, and lays claim to being the oldest pub in the town. And on their website, 
even they make mention of Charles Jolliffe and that he used to sell contraband liquor over the bar. I think that leads us on nicely to some of the folklore and stories surrounding Polpero and the Talland area and smuggling. In the previous episode, we talked about the Reverend Dodge, or Doidge, who was vicar at Talland, and that alongside being a renowned ghost layer, he was said to have been involved in smuggling. Then there's Willie Wilcox Cave, said to be named after a smuggler who's now rumoured to haunt the cave, alongside a range of other colourful characters. Battling Billy was the landlord of a pub long since vanished from Talon Bay, who um, allegedly uh, was, well, I, I don't know how much of this is fiction or not, but anyway, he, he, um, he used to bring the, the smuggled goods from Talon Bay into Polpero on his wagon, and he hit upon the idea during a smallpox outbreak of, of you know, putting the wagons, putting the contraband on his wagon, thinking that the revenue men wouldn't search his wagon for fear of catching smallpox. But anyway, so he was driving his coach and horses, well, his wagon and horses to uh, Polpero when he was chased by the revenue men, shot, and he was he was seen to be sort of still you know, riding his, his cart and horses long after he would died at the helm. So that was known as Battling Billy. And, and, and you know, there's, there's a sort of myth that's lived up that you could sort of hear him riding through the streets at night long after he died. I think it's called Willie Wilcox Cave, I think, which is by yeah. the harbour. Yes. That's one of those sort of yes. stories. Well, that, you know, the cave is there. And, of course, it does go in quite a long way and so narrow in the end that actually it's, it, it's impossible to sort of work out, how, you know, whether you can get on any further. But there are endless stories about there being a tunnel from there leading up to the Three Pilchards or the Blue Peter or one of the pubs, I'm not sure which. It doesn't really matter. I doubt very much whether there is anything there at all. But, you know, it, it, it's 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 if you had to choose a location for a... You know, your sort of ideal smuggler's cave, that's got to be it, isn't it? It strikes me as one of those places that lends itself to stories. Of and course, yes. The, the similar things of the um, the chap at Talland, the, was it um, Dodge or Doidge? The... Oh, yeah, well, this is the Reverend Richard Doidge, who, yeah. who uh, I th- you see, I mean, clearly, uh, I, I, I think he, I mean, he, he was renowned for being a somewhat eccentric clergyman, but 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 he also uh, had great cla- or made great claims as as an exorcist, uh, and and would be seen sort of running around the churchyard at night pursuing evil spirits. But was probably more likely that the spirits were buried <laughs> in the, somewhere among the gravestones. Um, but you know that, that that's how that myth came up. Yeah. See, um, you know. I, <laughs> fits the story bit. I think, I mean, when you look at Talon Bay and Talon Churchyard, it's got to be the perfect place for sort of bringing goods ashore and parking them, not permanently, but just temporarily. And I'm sure the Reverend Doidge benefited from the odd uh, barrel of whatever <laughs> going his way. I also asked Jeremy about this idea, which we've talked about before, of ghost stories and local legends like those surrounding the Reverend Dodge acting as a kind of cover story for the smuggling that was going on. Do you think the whole um, cover story thing, concocting or um, not kind of um, dismissing your own mythology because it's a useful cover, do you think there's anything in that or do you think that in itself is a sort of a bit of folklore that's developed over time? I, I, I think it's more likely to be folklore. I, I, you know, I, I think when it was at its heyday, the, the contraband trade was at its heyday, uh, people didn't need cover stories, really, because I think it was, it was carried on so openly. You know, because the, the, the exploits uh, and the adventures that ensued were such, you know, that they made great story material for, you know, for later generations, and it was sort of handed, passed down. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There we've touched on the folklore surrounding smuggling. 
perhaps inspired by or drawing upon events back in the 18th century. I think that leads us on to some of the encounters between the smugglers and the revenue men, or revenue officers, who were the forces sent in to try and put a stop to the trade. So, what do we know about these officers and the relationship with the smugglers? In my head, there's always been this vision of a constant conflict between the preventative forces and the local smugglers, and you hear stories of battles and ambushes on the beaches. But how much of that is a reality? Well, I think there's a key figure that we have to explore in the story of Zephaniah Job and the smugglers at Polpero, and that is a man named Lieutenant Gabriel Bray. So Bray, we think, was from Kent, and we think he was born in around 1749. He had served in the navy, including as a second lieutenant aboard HMS Palace under Admiral William Cornwallis. So he'd seen voyages around the west coast of Africa and the West Indies. There's a range of extraordinary pictures and sketches that were done by Bray, which still exist. Many of them from the time when he was aboard the palace. They're kind of cartoon-like, a bit like caricatures, often of the sailors or the people around him, the people in the ports. There's also a self-portrait dated 1775, that gives us a glimpse of the young man himself. It's really fascinating because he's sat shaving at this little mirror and he's got this very long hair, some of which has been tied back with a ribbon in the fashion among sailors at that time. And there's this look on his face that comes across to me as maybe a little bit cocky, a little bit vain... I'll pop a link in the show notes so that you can see that self-portrait for yourself. From the late 1770s, Bray began serving aboard the revenue cutters, initially off the southeast coast of England. And he seems to have gained a reputation for being quite ruthless. On the 17th of April 1781, one of his crew jumps overboard, presumably intending to desert, and Bray has him shot dead. In 1783, he issues a notice to the smugglers around Deal in Kent, following a raid that had happened five days earlier, in which he'd confiscated a cargo of tea, and it seems that there had been some retaliation by the local smugglers. He basically says that threats and bribes won't stop him, and that if anyone dares to resist, or to try and fire on him or any of his men, then he'll respond with force and fire cannons at the town if necessary. So I think that gives us a sense there of Bray's character, and the lengths to which he's prepared to go in performing his duty. And it seems Bray's reputation in battling smugglers only grew. In May of 1784, he managed to defeat a notorious smuggler and privateer by the name of Thomas Brown. And in this instance, the fight with the smugglers and Bray's victory was published in the Chelmsford Chronicle and the Whitehall Evening Post. It reads, and I quote, Captain Bray boarded him, and though Brown presented a blunderbuss, both of them not being half a distance from each other, the captain was not daunted. One of his men, seeing his brave master in this situation, with a cutlass, cut Brown's cheek clean off. Bray seconded the stroke, and with his cutlass nearly severed his head from his body, and put a period to this pirate's life. Quite a vivid description there, which, although probably heightened and embellished a bit, does give us a sense of the violence in these skirmishes, and it makes you wonder what was going through the minds of the smugglers in Cornwall when, in 1789, Bray announces his appointment as commander of a ship called the Hind, and that his new station now extends from Portland in Dorset to St Ives Bay. He puts a post in the Sherborne Mercury over five successive weeks, offering a reward for any information on smuggled goods that are going to be landed, and that if that leads to any goods being seized by him, 
a third of the share from the seizure money, as well as a fee from Bray's own pocket. He also promises to conceal any informants, and that they won't have to appear in court. He then says that the main port he's now based out of is Foy. So now he's pretty close to Paul Perrault. I wonder what your thoughts were on um, this character of Bray, because I, I think it's there's something about that picture, this self-portrait that says something about. I don't know. I I kind of read a sort of um, cockiness and an arrogance there, but I I I, I don't know if that's just because I'm <laughs> I'm weirdly um, siding with Job a little bit as I read, because I kind of think looking back on it, I. I might well have been involved because I can see how it. I'm big on community and and communities helping each other, uh, but I wondered what your thoughts were, having a sort of a bit more knowledge on on the subject. Well, it's interesting you you make that observation because uh, I I think you're probably right. I, I suspect you know uh, uh, he he was a um, a naval officer and those self portraits were clearly. Um, uh, created when he was i think it, 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 he he was actually somewhere much further south you know when he was in in his at the early part of his career with the navy but certainly uh he he became uh, quite a feared figure um further east in the channel because he for a long time he was stationed off kent and sussex and um had a lot of success against the smugglers there before he came down and, and um, aboard the Hind, uh, the revenue vessel, the Hind, off Cornwall. And um, he, he had a tough job on his hands when it came to um, Paul Perrault, because he, I mean, you know, particularly when he tried to lead a couple of, or tried to organise a couple of raids on Paul Perrault to try and catch the smugglers red-handed. And... Uh, you know, he he would, in a sort of pincer movement, he would send some men by land, overland, and the others would arrive by sea in the hope of catching everybody red-handed. But uh, they were frequently seen off on more than one occasion, and and there were you know there was a, a real standoff on. There was one famous occasion, I think it was about 1794 when uh, the revenue men were lined up on one side and the smugglers even had a, a small swivel cannon a aimed at them. <laughs> um, and I think discretion being the better part of valour, the revenue men retreated. That There was an ensuing trial there for a fray, as they, I think the, the, um, one of the Polpera fishermen was charged with assaulting a, a revenue officer. Take them to London, you know, that's the only way you can get a conviction as far away from Cornwall as possible. We can get a bit more insight into the clashes Bray had with Paul Perrault's smugglers from a raid he conducted in 1798. Bray had received information that goods were going to be landed at Paul Perrault and they were going to be stored in the cellar of a man named William Minards or Minards. Bray sends his second officer, Hugh Pierce, and some men to approach by sea, while he makes his way overland from Paul Ruin. On the way, he obtains a search warrant before meeting up with Pierce and puts some guards in place while they try and find a constable. For the next bit, I'm quoting directly from Jeremy's book. In Bray's absence, some of the mob had entered the cellar and were preparing to carry off the casks inside when two of the Hind's crew, John Hawkins and Richard Verron, attempted to stop them. Verron grabbed a cask from the shoulder of one man, but as he did so, both he and Hawkins were set upon and manhandled out of the cellar by the crowd, now rapidly swelling in number as news of the raid spread through Polpero. Outside, Hugh Pierce found himself thrust up against the wall of the building by Richard Rowett, who grabbed him by the collar and threatened to beat his brains out. At the same time, Benjamin Rowett warned he would shoot the first man to lay a hand on the cellar door while his fellow smugglers removed the kegs inside. 
When, eventually, Gabriel Bray and his crew did succeed in entering the cellar with the aid of a detachment of Lancashire militia, they found most of the kegs had been removed or destroyed. Say uh, someone like uh, Bray or someone kind of goes into Polperro and they are looking for contraband. Who is it that they're taking before there's a sort of... Um, are, they te- are, they sort of are they literally soldiers that they are um, taking with them? Yeah, well, they, you're quite right. I mean, because they, I mean, the hind uh, would only have had, um, you know, naval servicemen, admiralty um, men. So uh, they, they would have to rely on the local militia as well. And that's what happened. You know, they would get a, 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 a platoon or two of the local militia to go by land. The crew of the hind would go around by sea in the hope of catching them together like that. Yeah. Um, but in spite of that, you know, they were seen off by a, a group. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd want to face an angry group of Polpero fishermen who were defending their, their contraband cargo hidden away. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you get the impression they're really under-resourced, um, under-provisioned compared to how many people you've got. You might have most of a, um, a village or a community kind of against you. Not only are you outnumbered, but then you also have a sort of moral decision to make. At what point do you, because there's people who are maybe the ringleaders here, but you've also got other people who are just... Yeah, absolutely. And and in those narrow streets, you can sort of imagine in those very confined sort of narrow streets around the harbour, one could easily... Uh, I, I mean, uh, and there was no way they were ever going to catch the Paul Perro folk by surprise, because, uh, I mean, as soon as a a group of militia men set out from Foy or wherever they set out from, you know, that word would go quickly go ahead. All of this can start to make it sound like Zephaniah Job and the smugglers at Polpero were doing a roaring trade and that the revenue officers like Bray were fighting a losing battle in their efforts to try and stop them. But in 1798, events were to take place that would change everything. And it all really focuses on what's become known as the lottery incident. So I'm going to summarise things here a little bit and not go into too much crazy detail because you could almost do an episode just on this particular subject. One evening around Christmas in 1798, a man named Ambrose Bowden, who's the customs officer at Corsand, which is at the mouth of Plymouth Sound, is informed that a cutter named the Lottery is anchored off of Penley Point and is going to be unloading a cargo of contraband. So Bowden quickly gets together a small crew and they set off to investigate. As their boat draws closer to the Lottery, a voice calls out asking what boat are they, to which Bowden replies, a king's boat. There's some raised voices on board before someone shouts back, Keep off, you buggers, or I'll fire into you. To which Bowden displays the blue customs flag and shouts back, This is a king's boat, a revenue boat, and you can fire if you dare. Suddenly, shots are fired in quick succession, and Bowden sees one of his crew, a man named Humphrey Glynn, slump forward, and it becomes clear he's been hit. Bowden starts firing back at the lottery, but she sails off and the customer's men carry their wounded comrade back. But it becomes clear he's been struck by a musket ball, which has basically shattered his skull, and it's a wound that proves fatal. Meanwhile, the lottery has sailed back to Paul Perro, where they unload their cargo. Word quickly spreads of what has happened at Corsand, but when word reaches them that Glynn has been killed, They're well aware that the killing of a customs officer is obviously a capital offence, and so they set sail for Guernsey. Posters are distributed offering a pardon to any of the crew of the lottery who will inform on the captain and their accomplices, or to anyone who can provide information leading to their capture. But for a few months, the lottery and her crew managed to keep clear of the revenue boats and escape the law until one day, in May of 1799, the lottery is sighted off the Devon coast by Gabriel Bray 
who pursues them as far as Land's End, where, after a brief skirmish, the revenue men manage to capture the crew of the lottery and seize a cargo of smuggled goods. Among the crew who were captured was a Paul Perrow man named Roger Toms, who'd been on the lottery when Humphrey Glynn had been shot. He agrees to testify against his crewmates in return for a pardon and claims that a man named Thomas Potter, also from Paul Perrow, had shot Glynn. Toms turned King evidence and said it was Tom Potter who fired the fatal shot. And that's how Potter and others ended up standing trial at the Old Bailey. And of course, the, the name of Toms was then reviled thereafter, so the story goes. And, you know, anyone named Toms in Paul Perrow was, <laughs> was sort of sent to Coventry and treated like pariahs. Yeah, but, um, you, you know, because it was clearly, you know, to rat on your fellow crewmen like that was regarded as the worst offence possible. Potter is soon found in Paul Perrow and taken up to Newgate Jail in London. A few other crew members are charged, mainly with smuggling offences, and sentenced to two years in the prison hulks, which are basically prison ships where you do hard labour. Roger Toms was allowed to go free, but for his own safety, he actually joins the crew of the Hind. There's a fascinating story which I think is exactly the kind of thing that fuels those later tales and stories surrounding smuggling. Roger Tom's wife, Martha, is persuaded one night to go to Paul Ruin for a secret rendezvous with her husband. As they're walking somewhere above Atlantic Bay, a bunch of men from Paul Perro ambush them, taking Roger away to Guernsey and holding him as a hostage. And this whole thing delays the trial of Tom Potter in London, because Tom's isn't there to give evidence. Eventually, though, Tom's is found and brought back so that the trial can continue in London. But there was also another key witness in the trial, and that was Ambrose Bowden, that customs officer from Corsand. The trial was delayed several times, two or three times. And uh, on one occasion, one of the witnesses for the prosecution, a customs officer named Ambrose Bowden, was mysteriously taken ill halfway, because uh, again, he, he was traveling by coach from Plymouth up to London got as far as, um, where was it, so around Staines, you know, that area, overnight, because they had several overnight stops, and was mysteriously taken ill. And there was no doubt, in my view, because the, there was this scrap of paper that I came across um, where there had been an attempt by Zephaniah Joe, you know, to nobble the witnesses. Um, money was paid to... All sorts of people. And, and, and we think that either Ambrose Bowden himself was sort of, you know, agreed to feign. He was persuaded to, for a sum of money, to feign illness, or somebody nobbled his, you know, his, his, his meal or his drink while he, was, while he was in transit. Anyway, it merely delayed the proceeds. It didn't, um, it didn't stop them altogether. But it, it, it was the last time, I think, that Zephaniah Job, you know, was to attempt to sort of um, overturn the, the workings of the law, so to speak. Because I think he, uh, thereafter, I think he probably thought this is getting too dangerous. And he's sort of reverted to being a, just, a, just an ordinary merchant banker. And there's no evidence thereafter that he was involved in smuggling at all. A few things to talk about there. We have this mysterious illness that Bowden suffers on his way to London that delays the trial, and this theory that Job may have been involved, either by trying to buy him off, perhaps Bowden then feigning his illness, or the perhaps even darker prospect that someone may have deliberately caused Bowden to become ill. Whatever the case, in the long run, it only delayed things. Thomas Potter was found guilty of murder, and on the 18th of December, 1800, 
he was led to execution dock at Wapping in East London, and hanged in the traditional manner for those who had committed crimes at sea. And as we've learned, this case seems to have marked a real turn for the smuggling operation, and Job appears to have ceased his involvement. He was now around 50, so he might have been thinking it was just becoming too much hassle. Bray, who was also about 50, continued to live in Foy, at a house on the Esplanade, until he retired. The lottery was actually put into service as a revenue cutter to prevent smuggling, and Roger Toms, who had given evidence against his own crewmates, knew he'd be risking his life if he ever returned to Paul Perro. And it seems he actually ended up working as a jailer at Newgate Prison in London. I want to come back to Job himself now, and given that, as I've said before, so much about smuggling in Cornwall is caught up with rumour and legend, yet Job's story offers us a real insight. But I wanted to know where all these ledgers and these papers came from. How did Job's story come to be known in the first place? We have a man called Frank Pericost to thank for this. Frank Pericost, he was, a, he was an eccentric Londoner who for some reason decided to settle in Polperro at the, at the turn of the century, um, you, you know, about, about 120 years ago. He, um, it was he that actually came across this hoard of books, that, uh, ledgers and the letter books that um, still remained. They were in a loft in the, and apparently um, in the Crumplehorn Mill, as it was then, um, and started to, you know, he, I think he realised he'd stumbled across something pretty fascinating and interesting and significant, so he, he went through them. And then the second thing he did was embark on an extraordinary experiment with a man called Sir Francis Galton, who was a pioneering scientist who at the time was interested in whether f related individuals had similar fingerprints. Uh, and, and he needed an experiment, and he got Frank Pericast in Paul Perro to fingerprint every man, woman, and child. There was about 900 of them. And using those fingerprints, he, he drew up genealogical family trees around them. Um, and those all went off and disappeared into the College of Heralds for years and years and years. We finally unearthed them. But that was the sort of thing that Frank Pericus was engaged in. And, and it, you know, we, I, I think he really ought to get the credit for discovering Zephaniah Joe, who otherwise might never have sort of um, received much, much, you know, no, um, much note. And it was he also that was told that most of Job's um, ledgers and account books were burnt after his death by local villagers who, who were worried about incriminating evidence, you know, being, being found. Obviously, we can learn a lot from Job's ledgers about his dealings with smugglers in Polpero and the Guernsey merchants. But they also offer an insight into his other projects. For example, he ended up as a steward to the local squire, Sir Harry Trelawney. This then led to his managing the finances of other local gentry, including the Eastcott family of Lansalos and the Carpenter family of Raphael Manor. As part of the smuggling operation, he dealt with the Guernsey merchants and London agents, London bankers in Old Bond Street and Lombard Street. From 1806, he gets a banking licence, and he even has his own banknotes printed. He's known as the smuggler's banker, but really he was the banker for the Guernsey merchants, taking the payment for the goods from the smugglers. And getting the money from people can't have been very easy. Sometimes you get the impression he has to be quite firm. And to be honest, the whole thing must have just been very stressful. All these different business commitments can't have left much time for anything else. As far as I understand it, he he didn't have children himself. He never married. Uh, yeah. Very interesting man, you see. I mean, who knows? You can speculate about all this, but uh, um, he said he, he never married. 
but he kept in touch with his family in St Agnes. So, and uh, at various times, he had a, uh, a nephew, the same, his namesake, Zephaniah Joe, was a nephew who worked for him for a while, not very satisfactorily. I, I don't think they got on. But as soon as he, as Zephaniah Job died in, um, what was it, 1822, mm-hmm. um, the, the family immediately uh, all came, that, you know, uh, uh, arrived in Pompero to try and hoover up what was left because he died without leaving a will, which was always a, a, a strange um, omission for a man who was so organised. And um, many of his relations settled in Polpero afterwards. I, I mean, there are Job's still around, you know, in the area, various re- distant relationships, you know, distant relations of. Yes, um, plenty of them are buried in the churchyard at Lansalos and at Talon, come to think of it. Sounds like he was quite a risk taker as well, because obviously... Um... I mean, because uh, he's representing people, uh, you know, uh, uh, steward for people like Trelawney, um, but often they owe him quite a lot of money. Um, and I look at it and I kind of think that would that would stress me out because in a way you kind of, it's almost no surprise he never had a family because it seems like he was so driven to this career path and all these different projects that I don't know when the guy slept. I think you're right. I mean, he his output is just um, extraordinary. You, you only got to look at his letter books because he kept a copy of every letter he wrote. He, he then copied it into a letter book. And the, I mean, I've only had access to a couple of his letter books because they, they only two survive, I think. Um, but they, there is hardly a day in the calendar when, you know, when he did not write one or usually many letters, even on Christmas Day, he was still writing that there. I think, you know, he was a sort of driven man. Um, quite extraordinary. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think you're right. He, is, he was sort of just um, obsessed with, with running a business, which is what he did. He was a merchant banker. I mean, there's no other word for it, really. Started his own bank eventually there. An amazing man. He comes across as someone very quite approachable and quite open willing to help people there's a couple of times where he falls out with someone the way he words the letter is really really interesting sort of oh you know, yes like, I if mean, you have any feeling whatsoever almost yeah. like. oh yes i mean there are there are quite a lot of those he, he could be quite quite uh you know quite tough he, he wasn't going to be messed with i mean there are particularly with people who owed him money in one case he had to wait three or four years for his share of the <clears throat> proceeds and he, you know he was getting increasingly sort of irate and impatient about that but just going back to his relationship with the Trelawneys you see I think there was no doubt that he regarded it as a huge honour to be appointed steward to Harry Trelawney who went, who, who was a, a again a completely eccentric you know, character um in, and a, a fascinating man in many ways, but he was also a magistrate. But I think Job, having, you know, ex, sort of willingly accepted the post of acting as steward, quickly realised he probably had a bit of a hand here. Harry, you know, Harry Trelawney would go swanning around Europe for months on end, leaving his wife and family almost destitute, you see, mm. um, yeah. and, and Job to manage their, you know, their affairs and quite clearly they half the time they hardly had any money you know to be in debt to your steward by you know thousands of pounds i mean even by their standard it was thousands i can't remember what the figure was five or six thousand wasn't it at one point i mean that's serious money um and it just seemed a completely topsy-turvy way of sort of you know a family running their affairs but, I wonder in that case whether, I mean, um, yeah, it'd be good to get your thoughts on this. I wondered whether it was something to do with he saw this relationship uh, with Trelawney as a almost social mobility or a way of building word of mouth of I'm trusted by Trelawney, therefore other people are going to come to me. Uh, well, it certainly gave him, uh, you know, some social standing because he was then he, he felt that he would, be, you know, 
could write to the other sort of gentry in Cornwall. And he did on several occasions. I mean, there was one famous occasion when he he was trying to get uh, one of the Paul Perio men who'd been sentenced to death um, reprieved. And indeed, he succeeded but by sort of writing to some of the more uh, aristocratic characters in Cornwall, you know, who had real influence in those days. And of course, you know, the class structure in those days was such that, it, you know, if, if you were landed gentry, you had clout. Yeah. Um, and, and so to, you know, to be effectively sort of running the Trelawney family, he, he, he certainly had some clout that way. Yeah. It, it helped, I think, enormously, particularly when he brought influence to bear on getting um, Paul Perriman and, you know, uh, acquitted or certainly getting their sentence reduced. We've learned quite a bit about Zephaniah as a person, some of his background, or at least as much as we can know, his arrival at Paul Perro, the range of projects that he was involved with and his dealings with the smugglers, We've heard about the smuggling operation itself, some of the people, and of the clashes with the revenue men, and how it all seems to have come to a head with the lottery incident. Of course, there's still lots of unanswered questions, but it's kind of rare and unusual to be able to basically chronicle the journey of a smuggling operation through one man's involvement. In later years, Job seems to have continued to have an involvement with other community projects. For example, when Raphael Manor was sold, Job helped the tenants on the estate to buy their homes. He bought a number of properties in Polpero, including the actual harbour. In January of 1817, a huge storm hit, which destroyed the pier and caused a huge amount of damage and Job saw to it that the harbour was repaired and rebuilt. In his final years, he lived in a cottage above Polpero, visited by his doctor, who we mentioned earlier, Jonathan Cooch. He died on the 31st of January, 1822. So people who don't know or haven't read about Zephaniah before, how would you kind of describe him as an individual, or why do you think he's quite an important person that we should... um, whose story we should be telling, if you like. Well, I think he's, he, it's, it's because uh, of the way he ran the operation in Polpero that it, 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 it encapsulates how it, smuggling could be incredibly successful and lucrative. I mean, there's no doubt the sums of money gained through his books were staggering by any standard. I, I don't think anywhere else in Britain or anywhere else in the world, you know, could have had that level of trade. And this was going through one tiny fishing port in Cornwall. It's just extraordinary. And so I think he deserves credit for that. But not only that, I mean, you know, he has left a lasting legacy in Polpero because not only um, for the, um, the way that he finance the rebuilding of the harbour and uh, um, yeah, and uh, his, his sort of name lived on. Uh, I mean, you could argue that he's made a major contribution to the, you know, the economy there through tourism. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I suppose through, through reading through the sources and the information that we have, he kind of gives us a real insight into a subject matter that's often shrouded in a lot of folklore and rumour and mythology, that it gives us a real insight into what what was being smuggled, a kind of idea of how it worked, and uh, I guess the realities of, of smuggling, if you were successful. Yes. I mean, you see, I don't, I, I don't think uh, it, it was ever really made clear how it operated. I mean, people had a vague idea. Where was all the all these uh, sort of rum, gin and um, brandy coming from, probably from France, they thought, but no idea how it got across or how it was paid, you know, who, who was supplying who or why. Um, and it's only when you look through those account books and you can see how the goods were shipped across uh, in good faith because the Guernsey merchants knew they were going to be paid. Z- Zephaniah Job kept detailed records 
made sure the money was, uh, you know, remitted to um, um, agents in London who in turn, you know, would send it back to Guernsey. And so it was a, a sort of perfect triangle of finance that was going on that kept the whole thing working so smoothly. That's it for this episode of The Pisky Trap, and indeed for this series. A huge thank you to Jeremy Rowett Johns for all his help with this episode, and for providing me with a couple of fantastic books to help with the research. I also want to thank all of the amazing people who've contributed to these episodes by sharing their knowledge and helping me to delve a little bit deeper into some of the rich folklore and history from across the region. A big thank you as well to the brilliant Elizabeth Westcott for putting together the music for this series and the wonderful Karis Harrington for the brilliant Pisky Trap cover art as well. Lastly, thank you to all of you who've been listening and following the series for all of your support. Special thanks go out to Ken Chapman and Eldred Wolf. If you've enjoyed the series and you'd like to see more episodes in the future, then please give us a like and a follow on Twitter and Instagram. And if you can, check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the Pisky Trap. We'll be back again very soon. Thanks for listening.